start off by saying, uh, to remind everybody that this is being recorded. I have to say that because I'll forget. <laughs> Let's check that. And then I'll have, every, if everybody can introduce themselves so that those on the phone, we can hear your voice and know who you are. And then so you on the phone can hear the voices of us here and know who we are, too. So that kind of helps in our communication. So I've already said who I am. So Don? Don Woods. I'm the child care director and staff for this committee. And I'm Kristen Clotter, Teen Parent Program Coordinator. I'm reading my name tag. Um, <laughs> Committee that can introduce themselves. I forget. 
Hi, this is Robin um, Hilbenbar from the Ford Family Foundation. Thanks, Robin. This is Sabrina Ursland. Hey, this is Betty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, yes, Sabrina Ursland from Albina. And then, what were you? So the next person? Uh, this is Betty Steele from Kinder Care Education. Wonderful. Thank you both, all yeah. three of you. Do we have anyone else on the committee on the phone? Sorry, I forgot. Your names are right here in front of me, and I, I was so busy to remember to say we're being recorded, I forgot to have you introduce yourself. <laughs> remember one thing and forget the other. That works. So this is Shauna, and I'm actually just going to quickly just go over the document that you guys received that says principal on one side, and then on the other side, part way down, it has spark goals. So for those of us on the phone, that's something that should be received by um, committee members, and it should be posted on the website for any of our guests to be able to reference as well. So what this is, is we already talked about the principles adopted by the Early Learning Council, and we just kind of wrote them out in a format where you can make notes and kind of check them off, and we can see them a little bit more easily. And on the back, with the spark goals, this was part of our charter for this group being put together. So we really felt it was important that we also had this as a reference point. And we are so excited about a lot of the work that we've been looking at and that we've done um, overall for the system. And then our piece of it is a little bit more of a niche. And so the reason why we made sure we have this so we can, as the folks facilitating, can really help to tie us back to this. So our hope is that as we have suggestions and comments on things, that we can kind of tie them back to the principles and the goals to make sure that we're looking at that higher level piece of, of how it ties back in and what we're looking at with our suggestions. So we're trying, and we're doing a little bit more too about trying to get to the root cause of things instead of suggestions about how to change more what the concern is and then leaving the room for the how it's going to be addressed more to our, our contractors and more to the other groups that are looking at this work too. So that's part of why we um, added this and just that reminder, especially as we look at the second draft, that as we're getting the recommendations and pulling them together, we can tie it back to that. So that's for each of you guys to have um, as reference, and we'll probably bring more copies of this as we go forward, so feel free to write all over it, and for future meetings, we'll have um, additional copies for you guys. Is there any questions about that? We just really wanted to be sure we can do that, <coughs> tie the relationships together. I mean, if we can see that, then hopefully that will be, we'll be able to articulate that out to the community. Yeah. And if we have anyone else from the um, committee join, just go ahead and put a note in the chat box, and we can definitely make sure that we get you introduced if you guys, if anyone joins us on the phone. But right now, we have everyone that should be here. And we do welcome our members of the public that are able to join us. and. Um, Appreciate your participation and listening in as well. Thank you. So now we get to go right into the meat of the discussion. So Don or Meredith, Meredith is going to kick us off. So folks on the phone, this is Meredith. Let's see if I can camera. There we go. Okay, great. So you have in your packet um, the second draft of the proposed Spark standards. And um, as Donalda was saying, um, we were very cognizant in developing these that we were hitting those five recommendations that, um, that you had all agreed on a couple of meetings ago. And I will highlight those as we go through. Um, and I also wanted to just share that um, in looking at these principles and goals and having you think about, about these kind of policy level issues, um, we know there's a lot here. A few of the ones that seem very related um, to the standards to us were um, in the Early Learning Council principles number one, number four, and number five really seem to relate to the standards, as well as SPARK goals one, two, and three. So I can repeat those if you want, if that's helpful as we're going through to kind of keep your eye on those. So again, the Early Learning Council principles one, four, and five and the SPARC goals one, two, and three to see if we're meeting the mark around the standards. Um, so one of the first pieces that you'll see actually on page number one um, is that this idea that 
each of the um, standards really fit into a domain and that you folks really wanted to see that across the tiers, how the categories kind of fit together. And so in doing that, the other pieces that you'll notice are that um, we added a standard in the five-star tier around environments, enhanced environments. And you'll also see that there are compliance standards um, as part of every tier, which we do have now, but these are tweaked a little bit, and then also incorporated in the standards so that programs in the field really sees compliance, licensing compliance as integrated into that. So I think I'll just pause a minute and give folks a chance to kind of reflect on this document and see if there's any questions or comments about that. Um, I really like the layout of this document. I like to be able to see the fine progressions, and I like I really like the layout of the document. So I appreciate that very, very much. And that was Susan speaking. Sorry. <laughs> and actually, I, one of the things we had talked about is trying to, in each of these buckets that we're presenting today, really trying to capture what your consensus is as a committee. Um, so that we, again, we can kind of go back to your recommendations that you have each time that we're revising and make sure we're capturing that. So one of us may be popping up and down at some point or maybe as we finish the standards to capture those and make sure we're really clear. So um, so thank you, Susan, for that feedback. Any other thoughts or comments about this, seeing them this way? Yeah, Kristen. Um, this is Kristen Water, And sometimes um, in rubric for um, that can make things even more clear is if, like, I'll, I'll just use the environment example. First of all, I really do like, I, I agree, it's awesome. Um, I do have one exception, though. Mm -hmm. um, so for environment, um, on the three story, you have supportive environment, indoor and outdoor environment furnishing the materials support learning and development. For the four star, sometimes it can be even more clear if you say everything in the three star and. Mm. And then five star, everything in three star and five star and. And I think you had something like that in the original, if I remember correctly, in the original binders that we did. I think you, in those rubrics, you had it that way. And, and I think as far as rubric writing, educationally, that's maybe best practice. But obviously, this group is different. So, yeah, so just my suggestion. I, I really appreciate you picking up on that. And Donna, are you going to be addressing some of that in later today around the rating? I think it'll tie together, okay. but in terms of how the standards, I think that's good. But we'll be talking about how those connect in this rating concept okay. and the okay. scoring of it, too. Okay. So let's make sure we, we yeah. kind of loop back around with that. So okay. thank you. Yeah. This is Pam Corey, and I just need to say that that was the first thing that I spotted with what it wasn't clear to me. Can I have, um, a, you know, an actual uh, environment where you have used curiosity, inquiry, and engagement, but maybe you, you can do things that are fun, <laughs> and then you can do things that are intentional, and that, it wasn't clear to me whether or not things are fun. So, I just... so having it more evident that things are building. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So let me know when it's appropriate. I have some comments about some of the language in these things, so let me know when it's appropriate to talk about Okay, great. Any comments from folks on the phone? And I, um, maybe we'll go a little bit further down, and then we can we can look at that level. And as we think about how how it fits into these guiding principles, um, so and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, okay. So, and, and these standards have continued to be flushed out. So again, this is this is very high level summary. But then, um, if you've had a chance to look at these, these standards are more full. They're more fleshed out, particularly around the specific considerations. Um, and I wanted to highlight, this also ties into the recommendations you all had around school age, is you'll see the specific considerations. We've got infant, toddler, preschool, school age, mixed age, which really helps us to think about family child care, 
and out of school care, which um, Susan has been educating me around, um, around really what that means and what that looks like around school age settings, around um, summer care, et cetera. Um, so you'll see as you look through these that, that there are more specific, oh, and then you also see family child care called out. And, and we really thought about, you know, how there's, there's different ages that we want this to be relevant for, as well as different settings that we want these standards to be relevant for. So the specific considerations are really giving thought to both. This is Kristen Clotter, and that's an amazing evolution from the last week. So this is really good. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just one person, but I think that looks really good. Hey, anything from the phone? So you would also ask us to go back and um, do a little more work, a little more thinking, and a little more clarification around the educator qualifications, formerly known as, well, I currently known as personnel And we wanted to really talk about who are those personnel that we're including in the department standards. So when we are thinking about educators, which we, we've seen throughout all of the tiers, we're really thinking about those um, individuals that are responsible for the planning and the implementing and the evaluating the program's curriculum, knowing that is really central to then what all the other staff in that program are going to be doing. Say something about dream revision. And then at the, the five-tier level, the five-star tier, that is when we're starting to talk about all those other folks that are in that program that are supporting the curriculum, supporting the children, implementing the curriculum. Um, and um, those are our students. They are the assessment hours, so you're basically. And folks on the phone, I, if you could um, mute yourself for the moment, that would be great. We're just hearing a little background noise. And I'll just kind of, we did have a comment in the chat box that when committee members are speaking, try to speak up, they're having a hard time hearing you on the phone. Thanks for that reminder. So what you're saying is that the circle gets bigger as the tiers go up. That's a good way to put it, yeah. yeah. And you do have the details of those in your packet. So going back to clarify, what, what, qualifications, what qualifications count? What are we really looking at around these personnel? Um, we have five buckets of things that we're looking at. So educational attainment, and that's really the step level on our professional development registry. We have experience, like we talked about last time that we had heard loud and clear from the field around um, folks wanting that to count. We have professional development planning, and that's that really intentional piece that, um, that staff are doing intentional planning around what they want to learn and gain in their field. And then we had professional development, and that was that piece that was the look back around, um, around what types of trainings and education that they had had over the last year. And then since we met, we have added language support. So let's go into those a little bit. Um, so the educational attainment, again, that's the Oregon uh, registry, and that's all data that we have um, through the Center for Career Development. Experience we've got, and again, that's also something that's defined and verified from the Oregon Center for Career Development. And this is really that principle around we're building on what we have already and what's in the system. Professional development planning, and if you recall, um, that they uh, an individual could actually get more points or more credit for this bucket if they were doing professional development planning with another person, with a coach, with a director, with a um, someone else that can add to that expertise. And then this professional development bucket is what I was just saying about it's really that look back over the last year. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about um, using their, um, their involvement with set two and set three trainings as a way to measure professional development um, attainment in this bucket. And then again, what we've added is this language support idea so that um, individuals are actually getting credit for themselves and their program by bringing diverse language to their program. And we really thought about that as, as both supporting the children's learning. We know all the research out there on that. We thought about that in terms of family engagement and family involvement and how critical that piece is. Um, and 
that they can get credit for, for bringing that through. And I think there's also a lot of thought in terms of, um, or I've been giving it a lot of thought, also around what language diversity brings regardless of the language that the children speak and the family speak and how good that is for brain development and skill development in children. And so we've added this component. Meredith? Yeah. Um, can you go back to that slide? Absolutely. And Susan. Um, so I, I noticed in the educator qualification form, there's a point system and yeah. uh, like step level is weighted heavily and experience is weighted less heavily. How will language support be weighted in that formula? Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> nice transition. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Perfect segue. So in this new formula, it's the, the same way that we talked about it last time, is that they can get credit for those four buckets, but the educational achievement or the step level will always have the potential to outweigh that. Does that answer your question? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay. How on the language support, how, like if it's a, a language that's not common, I mean, are there going to be, you know, like I think if it's a language that's not common, will language be still going to be accountable for the language support? Yeah, I think that's that was good. Autumn speaking. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think that's a really good question. I think those are some details we have to flush out. Um, but I think that the, the key to this is really the language of the community. That is if they're speaking the language of the community. So we really have to look at what, what is that bringing to the program and how, they, how they're using that. So I think those are some of the devil and the details that we still need to work out. As a community at different programs, like in my program, I have people that speak, you know, very small language, but that's the community of my program. Right. And, you know, so which would not be anything to another program because of the language being spoken. Is that part of what why we were asking about having the environment enhanced, because to me that's also part of that environment. You're creating that culturally, linguistic, positive environment for a set of, for your, for your, for your set program. of, in, yeah. So did you have like a suggestion around that as your system? No, I just want to make sure that it's weighted, like that, that it's not excluding, like for example, in my program, my husband is from a very remote island. One of my teachers is from that island, but I have kids in my program from that island also. So in my program, I probably guarantee you there's nobody else like me, you know, in, in that particular language. So not to disqualify that teacher because she's dual language, but it's not a common language. I see what you're yeah, makes sense. So does yeah. she to make sure she gets that point system? Yeah, I, 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 I think yeah. I hear what you're saying, Autumn, and this is Dawn. And I think it would because it's reflecting the cultures of your, the people, you know, the children that you're caring for and those. So I don't know that it, it has to, I don't think there's ever been any thinking that it would have to be one of the five languages that we translate to at all. It's more the reflective of your program and who you serve and your, the experiences of that. So I don't, I never thought, I don't think we, I'm looking at these guys, that we ever thought about it. Uh, that there'd only be certain languages. Uh, yeah, because okay. yeah, I know, like, when I was doing my um, RES, you know, like, my labels and stuff incorporated some of that yeah. language, you know, on that, you know, so yeah. I went around to their culture and said, you know, what's it all, you know, Tom and Dina, whatever, you know, so. No, I think it's great. No, I, I yeah. think that's the richness yeah. of and why it was added as a part of it is because being exposed to other languages, no matter the language, is, is great for kids. It's a real asset. And to tie it back to the principles of the Early Learning Council, the first principle is, you know, operate with cultural responsiveness in the best interest of the children and the families. So that's in the best interest of the children and the families that you are serving. And that does relate to the SPART goal, too, of being responsive and promoting cultural responsiveness. So right there, you hit all of those points. And it also highlights that that's how it needs to be, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if you look at the bottom, there's a bullet where it says abilities that need a documented need will be more highly valued. So it's actually saying the documented need will be more highly valued in the way that this is going to be constructed. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's exactly, yeah. I think that was such a great example, Autumn, to, of, of the intention. And yeah, and again, you know, thinking, looking at, at these principles, how does this addition match with these principles? 
Any other questions so far, folks on the phone? So just a couple of quick examples to show how this would all look together. And again, knowing that, that these points are, are for example purposes to just kind of show how it all goes together and that there'll be more work in really figuring out how this all looks as we get into the full reading picture. Um, but you can see in this example that um, Dina is in a registered family, so she's the only staff person. And you can see the way each of these different buckets gives her points towards the total that allows her for a three star. And if my math is right, you can see that the Oregon registry points are tallying up to more than those other four buckets combined. Is that right? Am I not Yep. Um, kind of getting back to your your point, Susan, about how it adds to it, but but she's still going to get the most um, bang for her buck. And then a very different look could be at a certified center at a relief nursery. And how each of these different individuals brings something different to the table across these buckets around language, around their experience and their step levels and dividing by the numbers they get to, to the three star. Let me just check my notes on that. Any questions around that? We have a question in the chat box. Great. A couple that the, do you have it up? Mine just went down. Um, Betty asked, um, is educational attainment not part of this formula? It is. That's the Oregon Registry. Registry. Yep. yep. Um, another question in the chat box is, uh, who will be calculating these buckets? Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a good question. That will be... Um, to the best of our understanding so far, that will be part of the review process. Yep. And as I mentioned, some of some of this is calculated already. We have the step <laughs> registry in ORO. We've got experience information in ORO. And then some of this will be what they submit as part of their um, portfolio and then put together by the reviewers. And I think as we think about this being electronic eventually, there's going to be all this magic, this <laughs> algorithm, and there's going to be this magic, and boom, it's going to spit right out. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Hi, this is Kristen Cotter. Um, my question is about the experience. And um, I just need to be a little bit more clear about what counts for experience, because I'm looking at the three star under possible evidence, and it says years of experience working in the field of early childhood care and education. And I'm thinking about my particular um, providers, and one of them had her own in-home care for 20 years before she came to work for our program. Um, but I don't think that is in the Oregon Registry already. So is that something under this new formula that could be added to help her? To help her understand what Not what understand, would count to help her get document a higher point get her. score. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, there's a certain amount of experience in the registry in terms of how long you've worked in a facility, yes. but pre that or other experience that comes outside of what's there, um, I would, there'd be a way to document that within the system. That is going to be helpful. Yeah, good. Because my other one worked for kinder care for 15 years before she came to us, and that's also not in there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so it's, this is going to be super helpful. But yeah, especially in a small program where you have a percentage of people who have to reach a certain level, and two out of three, they don't. Yeah. 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 This is Cheryl Meyer. Um, I have a question about the um, professional, the ongoing professional development points. Um, do we know uh, really data around um, languages and how many set two and set three trainings are available? 
or even English set two and set three in rural areas? We do have information on that, but um, can you can you say a little bit more about what your maybe concern or question was? Well, my concern is um, around um, for providers and accessibility to so that level of training. Um, I, I don't. My perception is that there is not enough set two and set three training out there just in general, but in particular in the rural areas um, and in other languages. And so I would be concerned that we would be limiting people's ability to access those points by focusing on set two and set three training. So this is Shauna, and I think that that's a really important piece of information that we can pass on to our partners at ORO and people in professional development, because that doesn't exactly land in the work that we're doing here, but it's really important information for us to push for, because again, it affects how this stuff turns out in the end. So we can definitely um, push that forward and possibly get in touch to see if we can get some more information about that for you guys, kind of an outside piece of this work. But that's good equity piece. And as somebody that has developed that key training, and you know, it's an 11 page process and you have to submit it to Portland State for approval and they often come back with you know you need to make these minor changes. It's it's a lengthy process sometimes depending on you know how long of a training they're trying to develop and what the content is. And, um, so so I think some of the barrier is the process. Um, this is Dawn and I, I actually have had some of those like in thinking about this uh, from that equity perspective and capacity. And so I'm wondering just in terms of how to approach it, you know, so the intent behind it was of increasing the professional development, right? I mean, um, and there have been discussions about the capacity, what you just brought up, Cheryl, as well as um, having someone take a set two, set three training that maybe isn't quite ready for that training, you know, as things build. Um, and so I would be interested in terms of a, a any thought of a, a solution to represent that that might be different than set two or set three. And I mean, I don't know that we need to talk about that now, but if you think about anything, um, I think we'd be really interested in hearing what would capture that better. Well, I like the, in the, the personnel qualifications report for QRIS, it, it has two ways that they have to meet the ongoing training requirement. One is in the annual hours and one is in the previous licensing period. And to me that spoke to their, you know, ongoing um, effort to mm -hmm. learn and grow. And so in some ways I, I liked the, the previous way of addressing this. Um, and then maybe we just require a greater number of hours to get the the highest number of points in that category. Um, because then at least we're addressing, you know, people's ability to access training, even if it's a step one, for people that are at lower step levels and maybe aren't at the 7.5 yet and still need those step one level um, training, uh, but also the ability to find um, training online or in your community for other languages for people that live in rural areas and can't drive four hours to their local you know, R and R or whatever and then could access more training online that would be the set one. That that language issue is a critical one. As yeah, well. and I that I just I have real reservations about limiting it to a higher level or only giving credit for college classes because what we know is that we are years behind where we would need to be in offering an equitable level of classes that apply to the work that they're doing in other languages. Yeah. And we have a comment from Betty um, in the chat box that says, I think getting educators to the point where they are ready for set two and three would be a part of the work in the professional development planning piece. Yeah. This is Pam Corey and um, Cheryl's point is far more important than what I'm about to bring up, but I feel like I have to wear <laughs> my Head Start hat, right? So, but I want I want to acknowledge that mine is, is, is minuscule <laughs> compared to what you're, you're and I don't want to diminish that. Um, 
But I'm also thinking from a Head Start standpoint in the sense that Head Start has an enormous amount of um, expectations around training. And I know it's, for a lack of professional wording, blessed in the sense of um, having its training accepted. How is that aligning with set two, set three? We Head Start does not do set two, set three training, but how are we aligned? How are the public schools and the training that they provide going to be aligned with this? And and I just want to make sure that we don't lose that on the right of but please, this is far more important. <laughs> But, well, it has relativity. But it all fits yeah. together. Yeah. 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 It's all, all part of it. Yeah. It's all part of the bigger picture. Um, and then Chelsea? I wholeheartedly agree with both of your points. I want to throw in that it's really tough for UH providers to find a training that's appropriate to their job. And a lot of times they're checking the box on the training, like they did the toddler class that might be the set and CKC that they need when it's really not relevant to their work. Um, so there, even though it's not our work to do to in this room to improve this key system, it's an important piece of how this is going to play out. Well, it's a, it can be a barrier or it can be an asset. We yeah. want to make it into an asset. <coughs> yeah. 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 Maybe it's Chelsea and then Eva and then Nina. Well, I was just going to say I think the research going into the CPRN and really identifying regionally what's being offered, the number that's being offered, the the, <coughs> set, the topic to be able to give the resources to the providers so they have access. But if you if you really see that there's a void in one of those areas, there you're kind of setting them up to not be able to you know, get achievement in, in one of those spots, which I know for a lot of teachers, they weight that very heavy that they can't say like Yes, I'm earning points for this one area, and it's out of their control. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I think that if you make sure that the systems are aligned, you fix some of the issue with having access to the right training and Head Start uh, and K-12 have got a lot of training that would be relevant. I think that the two pieces really work well together and and that we should be really working hard to promote that. So it's not falling all on the organization other that it's again that collaborative and that partnership to raise the whole. So that was even it spoke. And that was a great way of kind of bringing that back out to the, the bigger picture root cause that we really need to look at is the alignment of systems to make sure that the professional development piece is supporting the educator qualifications in a way that's meaningful for the spark system. So this is, oh, I'm sorry. In front of you. <laughs> this is Nina. I wanted to add in, uh, in training, if you make five stars, and we can use the five stars and add it to racial equity training is included and not just mess because teachers can back up the training hours on the stems and music and literacy, but really lack the understanding and skills for providing yeah. racial equity. So I think that needs to be emphasized as well. Thank you. So this is Lisa. Mine is really more of a, a question, I guess. Um, so when you're looking at like set two and set three, when I think about the universities and my staff that are getting my community, you know, it's, it's really broken down into when they're looking at uh, the areas like you have to have so many of this in this area and account for this, so many in this area and account for this. And so I don't know if this is the way that this is set up, but I think if, if you were going to consider that one, that two, that three, like how many points for each one, or I'm not quite sure how this works. Sorry, I'm not a Head Start person and I'm not, but I do think it would make a difference. For, I'm, I work with school age, and I know school age is going to look at it just like what I just said. Do you know what I, does that make sense? Yes, and I think this is Pam, and I think that that gets to Mina's point in terms of, you know, yeah, I can take a lot of stuff all about, well, actually, music is kind of what hard from this point, yeah. but um, creative art yeah. activities. Yeah. I could do a lot of um, stuff, but 
how are we making sure? And I really feel like that's of the professional development piece that, that's not what we're working on because they do have different categories. But what we're, I think what, what you're hearing is that we're saying it's not reflected here in this system. And, and if you're going to um, have this system accessible to all these different people, it needs to be um, articulated here. Yeah. That's one of those spider webs that we got to connect. Yeah. yeah. So this is Cheryl. Wouldn't you say that the that is being addressed as you move up the steps? You have to have training across the core knowledge categories, and then right. as you get, you know, maybe past that three star mm -hmm. step, right? Um, then you have to have higher level training. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the way I see it. It's like if you look at the three star, it's kind of at that seven point five step level, and the majority of the if you're doing community based training would have been set one at that point, right. and then beyond that, as you go to the four and five star, you know, um, higher level have to have across all the core knowledge categories and all of right. and they have to have a certain number of higher level. And, and Cheryl, I don't know that Lisa necessarily knows the core knowledge area because I, she's I not in not. that world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So she wouldn't have known that the system does have to have that in place. And so my point is is that it needs to be articulated within this system. It doesn't solve those problems. That is the separate system to solve that, but it should be articulated. Because if, I, if I'm not understanding that, the, the preschools that I work with mm -hmm. in the elementary programs and districts are also not going to know that. that so, and honestly, that's been a big part of yeah. preschool promise starting in the school is, you know, me sitting down with them many times yeah. and going over ORO and, and all the components that come along with that. And, you know, it's been a year and they're just now starting to get it. Yeah. 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 And I know it's been really difficult. So we have also preschool trauma, but we also have um, a brain and employment funding with preschool in district. And uh, preschool trauma is struggling with this um, right now in um, my area. And I can tell you that the districts in the elementary program that have these preschools uh, want to jump off the bridge. <laughs> 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 they do. So I, I just think if we can articulate it so that they can have wrap their heads around it, I think this is great. Yeah. But if we get it correct, if we get the right. So I said that the alignment of systems and the piece are down. I made it as the education qualifications around set two, set three, language, rural access, um, school age availability, how I start this in are all part of that conversation that kind of feeds into alignment of systems. This is a bigger, higher level note that we kind of took out of that. And then I also made it as a spark means to articulate what is part of ORO and how that fits into spark. Did I capture it? Excellent. Because we could do all of this great work and then get stuck in you know, one of those unintended consequences. Great. Right. Good discussion. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll have one more comment. Um, I, I really struggle with teachers having to produce so much training and education, and it's not necessarily resulting in outcomes and benefits for children in the classroom. You know, they're getting a lot of content, it's very heavy for them, but how, you know, something that's really practical and that they're able to apply it and be able to make a change and modify their teaching or their interactions. And so how do you ensure that this, you know, their points really are benefiting the children in the classroom because if you're going to have class as an emphasis and how they're being observed, that there needs to be an emphasis in those trainings that really do support effective teacher-child interaction. So just, just because there's a great training doesn't mean it's really going to benefit the teacher in the classroom. It gives them great content, but how do you ensure that those create child outcomes? Um, this is Shauna. The one thing I'd say that kind of connects that a little bit is that because we have these other elements to measure other things, that like this bucket, educator qualifications, we can measure access and them having the experience and getting the training. The application is then measured by the observation, by that other piece of the system, because you can't possibly have this system 
measurable pieces of that. So that's why we had different ways of looking at things so that we're able to reflect some in, in by having those observations, which is something that is still in, right? <laughs> it's the reason why that is part of it, to, to get that. So the different part of the system, I think, is meant to capture that piece. But it is frustrating for teachers to go through training and to, on paper, look highly scored, but then if their class score does not reflect that same thing, there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So they're tr what they really want to do is do what's best for children, but if the trainings aren't are preparing them for that, it's very frustrating to them. Okay. I'll add a note when we talk about the education qualification professional development system to note that teacher-child interaction and application of work should be something in consideration. So we can pass that on to that group. Does that work? It also seems like that relates to some of the coaching aspects about embedded within practice. So that all those kind of pieces go together. That I mean, and I think that's, that's such a good point and a good segue to, to be thinking about how all of these five buckets fit together to then create a holistic personnel qualification. But I, I, I kind of want to stay in the weeds just, just for a couple more minutes before we go to um, it's the higher level policy document, if that's okay. So I, I, I'd like to propose two things. I'd like to finish the conversation about professional development and then Susan, go to your questions because it sounded like you had some, some maybe wording. So in all fairness, I think it, it would be helpful for us to share that anytime we have brought this new education qualification picture to different folks, we end up spending the most time on this bucket. And so it's both very helpful and very validating to hear you articulate so well and so knowledgeably what, what the hiccups are. And so just to stay in the weeds for a minute, do you have a suggestion from this committee around what we do about this? You know, anywhere from do we scrap this bucket and keep the other four? Or do we tweak this bucket and look differently at what we're doing? Um, and I think, you know, again, as, as somebody just summarized, we've got equity and access concern issues. We've got pushing people into um, levels of training they're not ready for. We've got, this isn't really pointing them towards the specific types of training maybe that, that might show in their professional development plan. Um, it's not system aligned. So do folks have a suggestion that we could take back to the revision team around this? Slide. I'm yes. my question before I have a suggestion is, um, is there a reason why, at least on the three-star, that it doesn't say completion of step one, two, and three training? Um, for this bucket? Yeah. Okay. I, I think the intention with that, for a star-rated program, we want to see that their professional development over the past year is at that higher enhanced level. And when we took it to... Um, to our implementation team, for example, some of the concerns were, well, they could be getting their hours through, you know, online care courses, which are not necessarily a bad thing, but don't necessarily always fit into that higher level. We want to see programs getting that more in-depth, more practice-based, um, or we want to see practitioners getting that type. So I think it was it was really that, that next stretch. That was the intention. I think the one suggestion would be at this point in time, that one training does a possibility for a qualification. I mean, yeah. this is Cheryl. I guess um, what comes to mind that might might work from my perspective would be maybe additional points for um, the planning bucket, the professional development plan, and like. Because when I sit down with a staff person and do professional development planning, you know, we pull all those pieces together, the, the actual plan from Florida State looks at, um, and we look at their professional development statement and map out, okay, like, you know, where are you at? What do you need to get not just to the next step, but I mean to the next three? Um, and, and what that looks like, you know, not just um, the number of training hours, but, you know, where you have the most, you know, training in your core knowledge category, and where, where you have the least, and how do we balance that out? Why? You know, why is it important that you have to do across all of those, and not just learning environments and curriculum? Um, but really looking at those next phases, and you know, what are the, what are some strategies? What are the easiest ways to get you there? Are you going to some college classes? Do you have access to that? Um, or you know, 
are they at a step five and they still need step ones, but let's look at some step twos in the areas that you already have training in and really mapping that out, not just in the short term, but in the long term for them and helping them understand all of those pieces and how they fit together. Um, so I don't know, maybe part of it could be like, if you sit down and have a comprehensive plan, short term and long term, with somebody that really understands the system, maybe giving them additional points there. Let me just kind of reflect back what I what I think I heard you saying is that, um, I mean, really the, the purpose of going for the set twos and threes gets to that professional development planning because it is to get them to higher steps on the registry is, is one outcome of that. And so that could perhaps be folded into the professional development planning that they're taking whatever is appropriate for them, whatever they need to get to those next step levels. So maybe giving, giving points in the ongoing professional development category based on how many hours they have in the last year because they have That's a developed plan. That's what yeah. I was going to say. I was going to say, what if the points for the section came from completion of the plan that they had already set forth? So whether they needed set twos or threes or set ones or they're taking Head Start classes or they're taking K-12 classes, that there's a way for them to show that they had a very intentional plan and they completed it. <laughs> Not because they're yeah. doing their 15 hours for licensing yeah. wherever they can get it. And it doesn't really add to the scope of their knowledge. And if I could, uh, it's in the chat box, I just, because I think it's, uh, Betty's also summarizing, I think, exactly what you're saying is that I understand the need for higher quality professional development experiences, but if the challenge is that such opportunities are not equitably available, it doesn't seem, it seems unfair to require them. I wonder if we could combine this bucket with the planning bucket and build in expectations around timelines. Um, it would also need to include assistance and resources for accessing the training experiences. I think that really falls in line with what Betty's saying with, I think, what the group's saying here. I think that well. would feel better just knowing that the, the provider or the staff person has had somebody supporting them in their plan in looking at their professional development and access. Who are you by saying with support? Who's that support person? That and let's remember to say who we are. Who's got it? Who is that support person that you're expecting that, that to be? I, I don't know that we have a in our county, it's the R&R &R staff. Right, that's what I'm saying. I, I want to know what your intention is behind it because I can't send all my employees to R&R. &R. I am fully capable of doing it myself. I do it myself. So I guess that support person needs to, needs to find out who, that's a lot of time for people. And, and especially like for myself, I have to reiterate, it takes me a solid, you know, chunk of time to sit there and and focus on that, and so I hit it like every couple months or whatever. But the lag time of PSU and us, and you're going literally in circles. So I myself wouldn't want to see so much heavy emphasis on that because in order to do that with our staff, it's very time consuming. Where if it's saying my staff is like we have to have 15 hours, anything up and above that for classes. If you there are classes, I, th I think there's been a lot of emphasis on like not saying there's classes. There are classes now. There's so much availability as providers. If, if you talk to a provider, if I don't even have to look for a class or I don't have time to take a class. I, I think the accessibility for me, it seems like they're, they're out there. I mean, we're, even the union teaches that two and three in Spanish. Um, I think we did a Vietnamese the other night or something. I can't believe that, but I'm not sure. But, I personally like the professional development part down there because it's an easy thing to say, okay, my staff did an extra 10 hours, she gets to be appointed. Instead of going back to do that professional development planning because it's so time consuming for her. So that's just, that's where I'm, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And, and then to identify who that support person is because I don't have time to send my, my staff to our office. Well, and just to clarify that point, when you, you're talking about the support person for the professional development yeah. plan, and I, I think that was meant to be fairly open. I, again, thinking system alignment, so thinking at a center, you might have a director, at a okay. CF, you have a the provider, at a Head Start, you've got, so that that would be, we would keep that very inclusive. I just have a better question. So, um, say you're uh, at a five star, maybe you've hit all the buckets, right? Of, is there also, can they also then at that point just take PBUs or, and get credit for 
that of interest once they hit, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just know that, you know, I have a very large staff, and so when they hit all the licensing requirements, there are things that are not, that are outside of that, that are of interest that, that apply. Would they get credit for that, I guess? Or if you're in a step four, or if you're in a star rating four or three, and you don't really want to go any higher, do you, will you get credits for that? I would, I would say that that I think that probably is a conversation when we're talking about the ongoing monitoring kind of concept and what that looks like. Yeah, um, I is wonder. Yeah, because no, I, I, th I still think there's an interest for the, as long as it ties into what they're doing. I just think you completely take that away. You need professional development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this is autumn. I think with that, they they can do as much as they want on personal interest, but it has to be tied back to their step because if they're not you have to have such an even, um, you know, in each point, all those categories. So even if they want to do the personal interest thing, it might not benefit them because they're not moving up. And the right? Well, you're looking to do. No, no, I, yeah, and you're talking about getting credit on the Oregon Registry for that. Yeah, they, they would yeah, get absolutely. credit. They would get credit, yes, but not necessarily that that would help them move up because right. they yeah. might that's not. What I, yeah. yeah, they that's would get what credit. Yeah, yeah and not necessarily help yeah, them move up. So I think we've got Pam and then Chelsea. So I don't want to, it's, it's switching gears a little bit. Uh, um, I just need to ask, because I'm looking at four star and it looks like it's only counting the, what I would call like the lead teacher, the main teacher, right? And that it's not until five star that then you can add the support staff. Correct. And so what I'm questioning about is, is that then you have a whole group of people that are interacting with children on a day-to-day -day basis that we're not including. Um, and I just don't feel like that's um, fair to the children and families without looking at that. There has to be a way to develop a system that can recognize that there are people that are just entering the field and this is where they're at, and still validate that this is where they're at. <laughs> and then I get giving higher points to people that have done more, but to negate them at all as if they're not existing or participating and in interacting with the children and families, I think is a wrong uh, statement, philosophy approach that we want to take. Um, this is Kristen Clotter, and I just I had a question which um, about who is, what's our definition of support staff. So, for example, we have a director, another person qualified as director and head teacher, and another person qualified as head teacher or teacher. So those are the three. So who's the support staff in my in my situation, for example? What does that mean? So I think this would be a good opportunity to clarify this a little bit. It might help the discussion. Um, and let's see, Rob, Robin, Robin's out of here, so we might want to wait for her to come back. But let, let me try it and make, maybe. So my understanding is that programs can define that at the three and four star level. So that if you have an assistant that you feel is part of that educator definition, that you could include that at that level. This is Pam, and, and my point is, is that um, I want to think the best of everybody, but the fact of the matter is that there are individuals interacting with children and families, and I think they need to be included and not judged on whether or not they should be included or not. So if I'm hearing you right, you're rather than the program defining it, you'd like to see the You should think of everybody it. that is yeah. interacting with children and families this is about a quality system, and it's not to say that, oh, this is bad because you just entered the field and you don't know anything. I'm not, I'm, it's validating. This person is here, and they need to be counted. They need to see that they're part of the system and that they have a way to go and a place to go, and um, it's just, it feels exclusive. So just for clarification, the way that the document you guys just gave us, are you saying that the educators, whoever, <coughs> Declared, the educator could be only one that needs to be at the star rating? Uh, I, 
get to step to get to a step four. I mean, not a step. Sorry, a, a four star. A four star. It, it, yeah. just, that's what I was clarifying. That's step yeah. by the same. So three and four star educators who are identified by the program as responsible for planning, implementing, and or evaluating the program's curriculum. So all the other staff wouldn't have to be out of step. Well, they, they wouldn't be counted in the formula. Where right now, it's, it's the percentage, the main and then the purple. <laughs> this is Shauna, if I can jump in. And Chelsea, we do know that you have been waiting very patiently. <laughs> but um, to, to look at this piece, so it sounds like the concern is that we need to find a way to acknowledge all staff who have contact with children, That's is what you're saying. saying. So my um, curiosity or like around connecting to that, like, do we need to have it in the SPARC system? Like, obviously, we have other ways of kind of acknowledging that, but does that need to be integrated into the SPARC system? And as we think about this, to keep in mind, like the equity piece is coming from our principles and like coming from our goals. The part of the reason I think that this got so complicated, and I know that like Head Start just got a full exception for it because it was way too complicated. It took a long time to get that exception for it. But for all the other parts of the table, like defining who is who, and we have a great model because we have three people in the classroom, but how do we count the two? Or are we punished by having a third person who's just coming in? So I think that we're looking at this, I mean, this could be the potential recommendation to find a way to include and acknowledge all staff, but there's a piece of it that the equity piece is really important and is spark where that needs to happen. Is that, this is my question back to the group, if that makes sense, before we make recommendations. So this is Pam, and it is true, Head Start, that was, the, they were the ones that had the, the big mess, <laughs> because, um, because we were, brought down in our numbers, and I think this happened in childcare, we were brought down in our QRAF um, star rating based on the fact that we included entry level staff in that. So I understand that this was a way to eliminate that problem. But I think in eliminating that problem, I, I have an, an ethical belief that we need to include everyone that is Working, I don't mean somebody visiting or some, I, I mean working every day with children. I think they need to be part of the system and they need to start to understand how they relate and where they are in the system. Uh, yes, there is the professional development path and that there is a place for them there, but I, I think it's excluding them for them not to be, we're assuming that they will not understand what. QRIS is because we're not including them in it. And I think understanding is being able to see the big picture um, is, is important. Is the ladies are kind of wrap this up for you. We talked about this last time, and I totally agree with Pam. She said, I know I said everyone needs to be included in the classroom to not to know how much of an impact they make on children and not to have them a part of the program. I think there are dishonest providers who will take full advantage of just kind of floating their program on leave and then they get to the five star and then they're like, oh, wait a minute, I haven't been encouraging, I haven't been supporting them, I've put it all on these three and now where do I go? And it's just not a right. It's not a right mindset when you know in a program the leave goes on break. It's put two assistants in there, and it could be for whatever amount of time, and it's an important time, and they need to have that, you know, support. This is you want to add that? Question? Um, I just well, is it okay? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so this is Kristen Clotter. So, um, I think we said it, but I, um, but I feel like we need to identify what the actual issue is because um, there is an issue that brought us to this point in the first place that we only include support staff at the five-star rating. So can we please articulate exactly where the issue, what the issue is? And I don't know if I can put it into words, uh, but I'll try. And, and that is people who might otherwise have a five-star program legitimately, not cheating, 
like my program, um, were um, only able to achieve a three-star based on percentages of personnel qualifications, percentages of people who met the personnel qualifications. And the two women I had, I'm sorry, ladies, they're the best in the state. Let me <laughs> say that. I'm just kidding. But I mean, they're really, really good. And they, they're super experienced. And, uh, and um, so the issue is how do we um, demonstrate qualified personnel um, I don't know I don't know how to I articulate it exactly do you know no I think you're doing a great job of trying I think that's a bigger thing that we need to look at and part of it can be so we're saying find a way to include acknowledge all staff with contact with children we can all say that we understand that the percentages didn't work and we can send this to the implementation team possibly to see if they have ideas about how to actually actualize this if there's a way that we just say everyone's part of the system or everyone's this, that there's a way to actualize this in a way that um, will reflect that. So I think that at this point in time that we're at a good place to take this recommendation forward. And it sounds like, and I'm getting everyone's in agreement with this, right? And definitely hearing a lot of people talk about this. Yeah. So, so with that to go forward and then bring that piece back. And those on the phone, are you in agreement? Hi. Hi, this is Betty. Can I um can I just offer a, a comment really quick? Absolutely. Um, I, I really understand the desire to um, incorporate everyone who is interacting with children into um, this equation. But at the same time, um, at these very meetings, I've heard a lot of anecdotal stories about um, how that can be problematic because the cook is interacting with children and they're not qualified, which I can also totally understand. Um, and so what I want to say is that I think we really need to decide here um, if, we, if we are wanting to incorporate everyone on the staff knowing that it will necessarily bring down the ratings of my program or my friend's program or whoever's program we have in mind where that would be an issue or if we want to allow the programs to decide who counts as an education implementer to allow them to achieve a higher rating. I don't think that we can have it both ways, and I think we really need to decide what the scope and what the focus of our work is here to guide that decision, because I've heard both sides of that story, and they're both valid, but we can't just keep going back and forth on it. Thank you. I feel that, like, I think everybody in your program needs to be or needs to be on the set. Like, not, not, and I think it needs to be part of the spark. Because I don't think that by just having all your staff not at a step level, it's not hard if you put the time in to get a step three at least. But to, to say that you don't have to show any of that is not making the professional development of that staff, you may not even have to talk about it if, if it's not. It, I, it needs to be embedded. So it's something, but not as hard as like what we were saying, the cooks, the van drivers, all that kind of stuff, you know, threw our numbers off. And But I, I personally don't think experience is high enough point either because the experiences are like one, two, three points or whatever, but it's not going to get, if you have a if you're going to count it in, in your equation, I guess the experience. I don't think that that's given enough weight, but but I, but I, all staff need to be on a step level. Whether that was Autumn speaking. I think she has the answer. Actually, um, everyone's on a step level, um, and that's articulated here as a bullet point. Um, and um, Yeah, but it does. But we keep it as it is here, where educators are separate from support. Is that? Yeah, I wonder. Is that the point. Point. Is the same system for your support staff that you're doing for your educators, but it's separated, separate table. As Eva speaks, that would. Yeah, I think that would be right because you're. I think the person running the program needs to be at that higher level. You know, I mean, or the owner, whatever. Is, I think really important. Because I don't think, Tom, um, was there a lot of um, 
people that couldn't obtain their star rating because the provider or it was mostly staff? I mean, CQ is in trouble. But is that because it's it's staff? For a number of reasons. Oh, you know, no. Partly because the defendant was required to necessarily achieve a higher level of score. And but, um, for the most part, the ones who struggled were the next year's staff. So I know that every. So every
in the thing that's not they're pa yeah. not penalized. So in other words, if there are four people listed, don't divide by four. Divide yeah. by three because based on the time frame this person has been on the job, they're not going to count yeah. in what you divide it by. But I mean, granted, if they worked <laughs> at another center for five years and just yeah. changed jobs, I don't think we should give them that. Yeah, and that's, that's right. Just like, that's I right. Just that lesson, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I'm kind of aware of time. Yeah, which yeah. we're almost to our next break, but just a quick process. So I know we were going to go back to Susan about some language suggestions. We also wanted to make sure we were really clear as to whether we are hitting the marks of the principal. So, process and I, I guess my and my question would be kind of for Susan: Is it is it because these are not like final words or language yet? So. That'd be great. So I think that would help with our process time. Kind of I just need to say with educator qualifications, you can't make it like doing your taxes. And <laughs> the kinds what of things that, 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 that are being proposed in here about different formulas, I hear what everybody's saying, and we need to meet educators where they're at and help them show growth and everything, but it, it can't be too hard to show it. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. You can't be comfortable. One thing on the, just on the definition I, for educators, sort of like what she was saying of people not like fully saying the truth or whatever, could you, I mean, would it be to add like overseeing the person? I think we can take all this back and work on it. I mean, yeah. I think that's, yeah. I think we've heard, I have, I feel I have a strong sense. Yeah. Meredith, I'm looking at the Woo team and they're shaking their heads. So I think we can come back and take another run at, run at this. There's some, a good variety of yeah, opportunities. <laughs> So as we close this up, we just so this is Shauna. So as we close up this piece, does everyone just want to take a look at the principles and the goals and reflect on all we've talked about and seen and see if we have up here that we're going to look at um, points of special development category based on completed developed plan, connect the planning, like the thinking we're going to look at a little bit, the way to include all staff with lots of caveats. <laughs> we're going to include, you've talked about the, um, the, education qualifications which came up to alignment of systems and articulating how it connects the systems inside SPARC and then um, taking out the, the previous levels and make it more evident that they build on those previous levels. So those are big pieces we have taking back. Looking at when you reviewed it, what we've talked about, to glance at the principles and the goals and like let us know if there's something else we haven't captured before we move this forward. Equity aspects, I think, is if we capture that, yeah. that's part of the special development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The language and the real access is right for them. Because that's the principle of the language. Yes. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yes, Susan. Um, so I think we're doing a really good job advocating for providers and their part in the system, but I'm not as confident that we're meeting number five, the principle number five, that we're ensuring family parent voices are part of this discussion. Um, you know, and I include myself in that, <laughs> in that conference. I was, <laughs> that's for the principal for the early learning council. Yeah. Yes, I was, I looked at the, our SPARC goal four, you know, I'm thinking that that might be one that we really need to be sure that we're beefing up to address that. But yes, I, I agree. So this is Shauna. So with that piece two, I know as part of our next meeting, we're actually going to be sharing the way that there's a setup plan to return to people who gave feedback, which included parent voice groups. So there is a place where they will be incorporated into that. And so I think that this, the work we're doing reflects that. Is there something in the draft? Standards that you feel needs to reflect that? I don't have any answer for you right now. Okay. I feel like our conversations are very provider based. They yeah. So looking at the standards from the experience of the child or the experience of the family. That's missing right That's now from our yeah. staff. Betty says, great call out. Thank you. So I think we're scheduled. Any other comments about that? We can make it so you want to have about a 10 or 15 minute break? Or?
we're right. Yeah, right. We're, we're right on time. I think so. Maybe. Huh? <laughs> time works. So let's have 10 minutes. 10 minute break. <laughs> Restrooms are out to the left. There's water, uh, hot and cold water in the kitchen. I don't know if there's any tea, but there's probably cold water. The phone folks are going to put you on mute and we'll be back.
Hi, everyone. We're coming back online. Welcome back. And so now we're going to, uh, John, yes. we're going to be the one that, John's going to talk with us about the rating system. <coughs> Anna, would you mind handing me the cover? I can definitely do that. Thank you. All right. So the next piece, and this is Don on the phone, for people on the phone, um, that we wanted to bring you is the, a concept around rating. Um, and one of the things that, um, thinking about it from a concept, so there's going to be numbers in here. Those numbers are not reflective. This is, again, just like the concept to see, get your guys' input and feedback on, on the idea that we're working with. Um, so the tiers, um, TRIS, we know they have tiers, um, all working towards that, that bar. Um, the standards will be used to rate the program. Um, but should also stand alone as well. So that's, you know, you kind of are looking at each piece, but they, they do build. Um, and then the portfolio and observations that the QIS uses both a portfolio and observations to rate programs. Now those observations might be at different levels, but there is both of those um, parts of the rating. Um, and so part of the reconceptualization of of the tiers is that it is, you know, that each tier is a three star will be understandable and measures a basic achievable level of quality. And that's the, the four star rating will build on the three star and be focused on the adult child interaction. And then the five star will be a more complete and comprehensive level of quality that builds on three and four star. So kind of like we talked about at the very beginning, um, making that more clear in the documentation, but that's exactly the concept um, that the standards are created around. Um, not sure where to point the pointer. Um, so kind of the rating and kind of the basics around that is that rating for quality is really hard, right? I think we've had some discussions around that today. Is, you know, it's important what factors do we need to include and how do we look at, you know, what is a measurable indicator of quality? There's lots of things that we can have, but what's measurable when it comes to the rating of it? Um, the quality indicators, they need to be inclusive of program differences and culturally responsive. So to, to have a standard to be able to rate it that allows a Montessori program to demonstrate their uh, pedagogy um, just as a, just think of a Waldorf or Head Start or family child care. So having them broad enough to be able to allow a program to show those differences. Um, the rating process must be effective and sustainable. And so again, that's part of the approach that Oregon's taken in terms of the portfolio, but also recognizing having some eyes on that is an important component. So creating that balance to have both so we can, so it can be sustainable. Um, and then continue our focus on continuous quality improvement by providers with the individual feedback to the program. And so one of the pieces of not only doing the rating, and so when the reviewers look and do the rating, equally as important is the feedback back to the program after the review has occurred about the strengths of their program um, and some of the additional findings to help with that continuous quality improvement. And so, of course, in a portfolio, we definitely need evidence that would be submitted. Um, and so they would submit that evidence for review. Um, evidence will be gathered also from the system. So we talked about Oregon Registry Online. There could be information that comes out of the licensing database. All of that, we definitely want to use system data that we can, and then programs submit additional evidence. Um, and that program will be observed at the four-star level. Um, and we have done kind of the budgeting and what that cost would be um, to, to, to make sure that that is, that we can budget for it because of what we've heard from the field in terms of the importance of having some eyes on earlier and to provide that continuous quality improvement. The four star, you can provide that if they're moving towards the five is the thinking. 
Um, and I think this this is really important um, as well. And so it's not you know so it's not just about the rating, but it's or the measures and those pieces. It's actually who's doing it, who's the reviewer, and who's the observer. And so within that this rating concept is that they would be selected from a diverse diverse population. They would be trained to reliability on whether it's the reviewing the um, portfolio or doing the observation. Um, and But the training would not just be on reliability of the tool, but would have a strong fo focus on implicit biases that the reviewer may have or the observer may have. Um, and how do you look at it from a culturally sensitive way so that you address some of the maybe challenges in some tools if we're doing it within our integrator reliability. And so in the past, in the last system, we had a block system of which you three star, you met these standards, four star, you met these standards, five star, you met these standards. This rating concept is utilizing a hybrid system. And I'm going to say these words, and I had to say them a couple times and then look at an example. So I'd like to um, show, kind of read this and give you the concept and then walk you through some examples of what that would look like just to kind of make it real because um, I needed pictures. Um, so programs will earn points for each standard. So again, those standards need to stay alone, stand alone. Um, programs must achieve a minimum score for each standard and an average score for a star rating. So that's that hybrid approach. There's a minimum. You can't have nothing in personnel qualifications, but be great in all these other and, and get to a, to a level. So let's just before, just to get our heads wrapped around it, look kind of at an example. And another disclaimer, I'm doing like, this is the third disclaimer, right? Um, the following examples are just to illustrate a concept. There's no decisions about the scoring and those points. We kind of, we have to get the standards done before we can start assigning. So again, this is the concept um, to, to see if this resonates to move forward. Um, so what you see here is that red line on the bottom is what the minimum score would be to achieve a three-star rating. And that then additional points, you would need to get a certain score to get the three-star rating, but those would be average with kind of the, I mean, it's probably not a good way to say it, but like the extra points, right? Here's the minimum. And what this does is it allows strength in one domain um, where there's maybe other domains that maybe not quite as bad <laughs> different places. And so, for instance, you can see in this first example, um, achieve a star, a three-star rating. I think I might have to stand up to do this, actually. Um, to achieve a three-star rating, so this one, they are all above the minimum, and some are below the average score, but some are over. So that average means that they achieve a three-star rating. And so you can see in the next example, Again, all of them are have met the minimum score, um, but they're low. They're really high in this area. So when you average those, they've achieved the rating. If program C goes across, achieves a three star, they're all boom, 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 boom. <coughs> well, I'd be really funny to see that ever actually happen. Maybe I don't know. Um, but I think what kind of really illustrates what the difference is is on here, in this domain, they did not meet the minimum um, score, so they would not achieve the star rating because you have to get at that minimum. So you can see that in both, at the four star, it's exactly the same concept. The scoring would be different, but the, the concept of a minimum to to an average between that is how a program can show their strength, um, kind of submit everything and see where they fall out as well. Um, and then again, at the 
four star at the five star. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, that's the extreme example is here. If you don't meet the minimum for a score at a five star in one domain, you're not in your off the charts in the other. You've got to come back and get this at least to the minimum. Does that make sense in a, as far as a concept? Um, there are head nods about, here. Head nods for people on the phone. What about the minimum for a four, six, or five? I don't think we know the, 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 what those thresholds are. This is the concept of but I think the thinking is there could be one minimum, but the minimum could also, you know, up their stair step up to that block system. You would stair step it up so your minimum increases as you go up the tiers um, as, as well as your average. But you would essentially be able to say you just got a rocking environment, right? you'd be able to get all of those points and environments out of the shoot. And that could help other areas where you need to, um, you know, do continuous quality improvement. Um, and so that's the, the rating concept um, that we're bringing in front of you. And so again, this is again the reiteration that hopefully those slides help kind of come to light is that programs will earn uh, points for each standard. They must achieve a minimum score for each standard for that tier level that they're going for or whatever they come in at and achieve an average score for that rating. Hi, this is Betty. Can I ask a question? Sure, Betty. Thanks. Uh, I just need to sometimes say things out loud to make sure that I'm understanding them. Um, so at those, those graphs that you had up before, um, those programs didn't achieve their three or four star rating because they met the minimum. They achieved that star rating because they met the minimum and their average scores above that second pink line qualified them for it. Am I understanding that right? Exactly right, Betty. Okay, so thanks. Yep, must do the minimum and then achieve in their average score that next threshold number. It's so interesting that you say that, Chelsea, because that is one of our policy questions that we wanted to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> is that, and I think that's the discussion that we want to have in terms of moving forward is what are the strengths and challenges with having minimum score for each standard and, and how we're looking at that? Um, should any domains be worth more? And then I also just kind of want to highlight that you know, in, in looking at this, our SPARC goal, and I think it's number three, if you look at this sheet, um, provide an opportunity for early learning programs to shine and demonstrate their strengths. So those were kind of the, the piece, the, the questions, policy questions that we wanted to ask you, as well as thinking about it in terms of, is this rating concept meeting that SPARC goal? There's a note in the chat box from Robin. She said, wow, a lot of thought went into that rating concept. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So thoughts on kind of, um, maybe we should just start with Chelsea's question. Should any domains be worth more in terms of when we consider like actually getting um, what, what that scoring would look like? Pam and I'm trying to, it takes me a while mathematically to wrap my head around things a little bit. So is, isn't that done by when you set the higher standard? I mean, so it's not to say it's, no, not the minimum, the, high, the higher standard. So in other words, well, it could actually be both, it's both the minimum and the higher standard. Because you can just do that for each domain, you can decide where it goes for four and five without without necessarily saying that you believe that the environment is the ultimate and that it must get all the credit, right? Well I think this question can I'm lead into question, wrap my head no no of how we have how the points might get assigned to each standard. Mm -hmm. 
So let's say across the board, uh, I'm making this up, is that at the three star level, everything, you know, you have a maximum, uh, you know, it's five or at each standard, you could get five points per standard, just for right. easy math. Should one of those domains, should that one maybe be worth 10 points yeah. in the scoring? So let's say that environment is the number one thing. Everyone else, every other standard would, could get a possible score of five, but the environment standards would be 10 each. So is there a domain that should be, the points should be higher in value than the other domains? That, that's, that's a question that, I think if you kind of look, or do you have an idea? I was thinking maybe you could go back to one of the graphs. But I think they have the domains across. Well, I was going to refer them to their actual, yeah. their, their standard. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, this sheet, yeah. this sheet would kind of help you look at it in terms of the domain of environment, learning and development, the inclusion of children, families, <coughs> cultures, positive relationships, <coughs> educator qualifications, and children's safety and program stability. So if you think about those domains, is there one that should have a higher weight? Should one area be more points than the other, or do we feel they're all equally valued? This is Kelsey. I think based on the number four principle, that um, wherever the class four comes into play, because then you have something that's data-driven, um, as well as practice-based evidence. So those are things that you can actually measure what's going on in the classroom and, and could consider uh, work more. Okay. Did you just name, I'm sorry, this is Christine. Did you just name a domain? I named the domains that have a better type of class observation. And which ones were they? So it's learning development and positive relationships. Those two at the four-star standard has a class four to it. And I did have a question. Why does class go away for the five-star? It doesn't go away. It's part of that building block approach. So they have had it at the four-star, and then we weren't adding in to do another class observation at the five-star. And just to be honest, it has to do with resources. So you're saying that the that not at a domain level, but at a, those two standard levels, maybe should have more weight. Okay. This is Pam, and I'm an honest question. Are we sure that the class is culturally relevant in all situations? Are we confident? I think we are as confident as the best tool that we have in our field. And I think that's why a lot of emphasis was put on the reviewer and the observer to be, um, to be culturally sensitive, understanding, and understand those implicit biases. And we actually did significant research in, around where those biases fall. And that is really the best way to mitigate that is by the observer themselves. If you have an English-speaking observer going into a um, Spanish-speaking home to do it, that's going to be a lot harder. You're, you're not going to pick up those nuances. Right. So you've got to understand and understand your implicit biases. And so the way to mitigate that is the importance of that reviewer-observer criteria. When you say class evidence, um, you put this of the class as a point. So if they average six points, then it gets six. And if they're three, we don't. But and, it's, and because of the hybrid, maybe you're, and I don't, we don't know what the points are, again, like the concept of it, but that by both to mitigate any bias, any concerns, we would, that, that's the importance of the inter rater reliability of the observer. But then whatever those points would be, it, that would fall in as part of that averaging too. So while you might have a maybe a lower class for typically your environment is, is often that's where that would counteract to kind of balance some of that. This is something, 
will you have a minimum class or threshold? We don't know yet. That's, so again, this is all the concept of what of how how to do that. This is Pam. I think you have partners at the table that are as familiar with the class and what you're talking about because it's not in this document. Mm -hmm. I think it might be harder for them to follow exactly what we're doing. Yeah, I, I guess I just um yeah. Oh well, that's me. We've got. Well, no, <laughs> yeah. Kristen asked the question. I got it all the around class. <laughs>
and in the chat box, Betty shares, I would hesitate to weigh the domains differently because if they aren't all important, if they aren't all of critical importance, we need to revisit their use in the first place. Um, I don't think the domain should be weighted differently. All of these domains are vital to high quality care and there is research evidence for all of them, even if one specific tool does not treat them um, preferentially. I, this is Danelda. I was just, I'm, I'm struggling with that too because I even think about safety, you know, children's safety and stability. That's really critical for children as well. I'm having trouble weighing one above the other. Okay, I just have to speak up. This is Lisa. I, um, I know I come from a little bit of a different perspective, but um, which is why you're here. Uh, yes, we value that. Very good. Why I'm here. Um, I, I find it, I really want to say that I feel like the learning and development and the curriculum supporting the children, um, I think where the state is going with kindergarten readiness and third grade readiness and reading skills. I just feel like that, I think they're all important, don't get me wrong, but I feel like that should be weighted more heavily. That's just <laughs> Oh, this is the thing. Sorry. I'm, I have to be called on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Christy Clotter. Um, I have another way to think about this um, that, that um, for a lot what which of these domains is grammar in in this situation is what is grammar which would you which say is domain is oh, grammar grammar is children's safety and program stability it's like it has to be there but to be graded on it um, as much as the others I don't I think yeah or environment maybe would be grammar the ones that I would weigh less would be grammar. This is Mina Smith. I I, I agree with Chris. It teaches skills and interaction, and it, the knowledge comes in action can overcome some of the limits of environment. And so I think those should be weighed more. And also that if they are located or have the home that certainly limited to move up, but they can really get equipped, you know, better at interactions and in inclusions and uh, you know, how they execute the curriculum and they can improve the total quality of the care and it should not be weighed down just because the environment was the same. Can I, just a quick process piece, sorry, Susan. It, it, I think um, from a staff perspective, it would be really helpful if, as you're sharing these specific ideas, if you can tie them into these principles at all. I think that helps us to, to get to what they were saying earlier, like what's the root, root of these suggestions? So kind of mixing both the, the specific suggestions with, with the, the principle as to why. So sorry, Susan, go ahead. Yes, this is Susan. Um, and I think as a parent and a provider, to me, the most important ones on here are the experiences that children have and how they are treated in the program. Uh, so while all the rest is also very important, but like if I was going into a program as a parent, how are you going to treat my child? What are you going to do with them while they're there are the most critical pieces to me. Um, 
and as I visit programs, evaluate programs, give training and technical assistance to programs, I know that if they don't have positive relationships with the students they're working with, they cannot have learning experience in the classroom. It starts with those relationships. So those two to me are critically, you know, they, they're like a little bit above the rest, but it's all. Susan, I just want to make sure I got the domains right. The positive relationships in the second domain was learning and study okay. development. Okay. Yeah. Two I marked. Oh, <laughs> I was understanding it. Okay, good. Great. So I feel like that's, I mean, there's kind of both. There, there's a couple ways to think about it. I think we can take, do you have any? Well, I, I guess actually, I, I feel like we've listed almost all of the domains in this conversation. <laughs> So I, I'm wondering if we could get some consensus from the group of how we take that forward, because we're going to need to come back to you and say, okay, we're, we've now weighted them in such a way based on your recommendations, but we've, <laughs> we've had a great diversity of them, so can we get... So this is Shauna. From what I heard from this conversation, and please, and all that wrong stuff, and if I'm not saying this correctly, it sounds like the highest rated we launched is learning development and positive relationships for a multitude of reasons, tying back to standards that parents want, tying back to... Um, the evidence base to support some of those pieces. Then the middle level, for lack of a better word, would be the inclusion of children, families, and cultures, education, educator qualifications, and at the lowest level would be the environment and children's safety and program stability. But we also have the argument on the table that we need to have them all equal. So those are the two kind of based on people are saying that I'm seeing. Is that what you guys are also seeing? Hi, this is Betty. Shauna, thanks for including that last bit. I strongly feel that they should all be weighted equally. Is there anyone else, this is Shauna, is there anyone else that feels strongly that they should be weighted equally? We have heads nodding no in the room. And folks on the phone, does anyone else, Sabrina or Robin, you guys want to chime in on that at all? Hi, this is Robin. I. I am more inclined to weigh them equally, knowing that while I'm, uh, from my viewpoint, going to always say relationship is more important, and, um, but then you could argue that there are settings where the relationship is on, but there is no curriculum, and so there, there I, I know that it seems like everyone from different value vantage points could see one as being more important, so the, the complicated, but just complicated enough to be well-balanced way that you develop the baseline average and as well, you know, the two ways that you are scoring those different domains, I think would take care of making sure that across the board it was a quality program. So that makes me think that an added complication of weighting them could unnecessarily make it more complicated. Um, but uh, so that's just my two cents, I think, in I'm more inclined to be closer to Betty's uh, recommendation, but I could be swayed if there was real research that showed that one clearly has to be more important than others. I just wanted to add really quick to what Robin said. This is Betty. Um, that that's part of the reason why I believe we should weigh them all equally is that we can quickly disintegrate into a philosophical debate over which um, domain is more important and why, um, but how much of that reflects our own personal values and experiences and how much of that is steeped in real evidence of what quality care and education looks like. Is this called a conundrum? <laughs> I guess why. This is Pam. I want to see the research um, because whether it's because I've been part of Head Start and it's been drilled into me, <laughs> um, but positive relationship, and to me, I think that's also, pardon me, Lisa, but I even think it's over learning and development because I think if you don't have positive relationships, learning and development just doesn't happen. Um, then you have a lousy environment, then it's hard to have the positive relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get that they're totally integrated, but I do believe that you can have, um, be constrained by your physical environment for socioeconomic, cultural um, reasons, and there's cultural judgment there 
about environment, too. But warm, caring, positive, engaging interactions, I, that's universal. It doesn't matter what culture. It's, it might look different in different cultures, but it's still the ultimate. And I just, I, I can't let go of that. And I'm sitting here, I've been struggling with that whole family thing. <laughs> um, because, I mean, that's the head start, you know, mantra. And I'm just like, oof. Um, but I totally get that um, Head Start has been funded and directed and guided as a family is, is to make sure that the family is always part of that. And I think it's unfair to hold programs that have not been funded and supported um, to do that as recognizing that that's like a higher level um, to put that in. And so that's why I still have to stick with positive relationships with my development. So I actually sent Eva's hand and then I saw Susan. So Eva? And this is Eva. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Um, I, I'm just wondering as a, as a process thing, rather than weighing them heavier, if you could set a different minimum for the different domains and maybe look at it a little bit differently that way. That's what but, I thought originally. But. And I don't know. I mean, it, it's just another way to think about it that, that maybe. Um, instead of it's weighted twice, it, it's got a minimum score that's one or two points higher. Um, so giving equal weight, but but then requiring a little bit higher mm -hmm. minimum level in, in different cases. Mm -hmm. um, this is Pam. I was thinking that way, but I think that's what you're doing. You're just doing it differently. But you are waiting. You are waiting. It. You are waiting it differently. So go ahead, Susan. Um, I just wanted to point out that there is lots of research around developmental relationships and how critical they are. So there's is that it's there. Yeah. And I, I'll just give an example um, of that. If anyone wants to read *The Mindful Parent* by Charlotte Peterson, she traveled the world. Um, and shown how positive relationships with the kids seem to support things to raise um, kids. And this isn't our own cultural bias. This is she's lived in different cultures and done it Chelsea? Um, I think what if if you went the direction of not waiting, then the way to have a waiting at at some point is by the scores that you pick for the class. So if you would, if you don't want to say that one is worth more than another, the score that you then pick for um, each of the domains within the class tool, then that would really show the emphasis on the value of what the teachers are doing in the class. So you could, it will still have its importance depending on the score that you pick. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I still, I mean, yeah, because there's different ways to construct that, right? Whether it's in a minimum, in the score, in the value, or in a the weight. I mean, so just the. I mean, if I could, I just see if I. The summary I believe is is that adult-child interaction is the most important piece. Is what I think I heard, and then followed by the family. Um, piece. And is that not what I heard? Learning and learning development. development. Yeah. Learning and development. Okay. That one too. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So this is yeah, Shauna. Yeah. I think the one the one thing we probably need to resolve is um, based on what Eva came up with as a concept of just raising the minimums and incorporating what Chelsea is saying that we could possibly work with the score somewhere else to emphasize these areas um, with the class scores, for instance. So given that concept that instead of it just being instead of us weighting the domain. Instead, we're um, weighting the minimum and making it so that addresses what Robin was saying about keeping things less complex. It shows what other people said about we all think all this is important. So it addresses some of those pieces. So can we look at, again, to get like a consensus of conversation vote about if people are interested in the concept of having different minimums to kind of be where the weight is versus the domains being weighted? This is Pam. 
and I think the deeper thinkers behind me um, in terms of the research, I mean, because of the mathematical um, piece, I feel like that's um, beyond what I can do in this short amount of time. Maybe if I sat with them, I'd get some hot um, sauce <laughs> in that. But I, I believe that they should be waiting. Whether it how, uh, how it's weighted, I think needs to be evidence based, and I don't feel like I have that evidence knowledge to know which way it should go. And I hope I didn't derail because my intent was just to give an example to make an example by no means of how it might be done. Just should there be consideration of different yeah. scores, different values. The other thing is when we're talking about the age range, some of these. Change too. I mean, when we're talking about infant toddlers versus infant preschools versus school age, so we, I think we need to look at that over that continuum. Hey, this is Betty. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, something that I want to point out that's probably a little obvious, but is that in reality, these things all um, interact and affect each other. In, in complex ways that we can't measure or separate out. And so I just wonder, I worry about um, weighing them differently or having different minimums, however we want to basically say that one is more important than the other, because in reality, the environment affects the relationships, vice versa. And th those things change from moment to moment within a day, within a school year, and over the age groups. And so again, it just feels like an exercise in like, intellectual futility to spend time deciding who thinks which domain is more important and who thinks another one is more important because in reality they really are, um, there's research to show that they're all critically important to children's development. And I know that Robin said in the chat box that she thinks it needs some more, some testing um, and that that would be work that we would could go back and look at. I think based on where we land on a consensus direction of kind of looking of how to explore and get deeper into this. So, Shauna, is that what you're summarizing? I'm thinking. Is, is, this, is this a summary? I mean, the other piece paper is very messy. So, this is what I try to summarize. Yeah. I think so, our recommendations would be um, how it's weighted. It sounds like we do have a majority saying it needs to be weighted somehow. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm trying to push for more like. So, how weighted needs to be evidence based. Um, it needs to not be too complex. Again, like we said, like Pam shouldn't have to take two extra you know, graduate courses to do the math on it. So not too complex. We have initial thoughts about where we think things land, but again, we need to have evidence based and we need some testing before we can look at that. But then our initial thoughts are about learning and development, how the relationships go higher, um, children and families and culture next, educator qualifications right below that, and then lower for the children's safety and the environment. Well, no. we do have a consensus, so it feels like it should be equitable, whatever. The weighting should be equitable. So I think, like Betty and, and Robin had expressed that. I think we don't want to lose that class. So just weighting needs to be equitable? Right. Okay. Which was the Does that? So that's a question. I mean, what do you mean when you say it needs to be equitable? Well, what I thought I heard them saying is that all the domains are important and that we should yeah. weigh them. So there are two, two different points two different in the room. Yeah. Correct. There, there's some viewpoints that it all needs to be equitable and then there are viewpoints um, that it needs to be weighted somehow uh -huh. and there's some criteria about how it should be thought through. So and, and I think that if we get information and evidence that might help us in deciding which way we want to go. So that both is coming back to the perspective, both of So this is Shauna, and let me check with and all that. Are you good with the not too complex and the need some testing and the evidence base be the way that we're addressing what they were talking about and we take out the equitable piece because then we're going in two different directions and the majority consensus was for us to look at it being weighted. Saying that we should, we have two minority reports, I guess you could say. So I wonder what how they feel about looking at exploring right. it that with, right. without recommendation. So Robin and Betty, do you guys want to chime in about how you guys feel about us keeping in mind it's not too complex, 
that the waiting needs to be evidence based and needs some testing before we make a determination. Are you guys comfortable with that? That sounds fair. What did you say? No, sorry, honey. Oh, it sounds fair. Oh, sorry. This is Betty. Yeah, I said that sounds fair. And Robin said that's fine. We're on such a tight revision timeline. How do we test this? Yeah. How, how is that even possible in your process? I don't think it is. I think we can, we'll, we'll that, that'll be our charge to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> and just being sure that we're maintaining our, our um, commitment to that quality, that it, that it is measuring the quality indicators of the time. Okay. And this is something, I would just say that this may be a good time for you to also start looking at the class board. Because you may find, like, I don't need to wait it because of, because of, or we want to keep Passport is a little bit lower, but we are still going to wait. You know, like you can kind of have a conversation. Great. So, to, to kind of, in like, I think we have about 15 minutes if it takes that long to kind of move on to the next policy question. And again, really referencing of comments of how we can connect these to kind of the principles or the SPART goals is with this rating concept, again, knowing that there's a lot of details to work out and, and how that all works, is. Um, what are the strengths and challenges with having a minimum score for each standard? And we've, I think, addressed some of it here just in terms of the weighting. Are there any um, considerations in terms of the strengths of that approach? Um, or do people feel pretty sound in how it was described? Um, and it's really more about how, how, that, how this works out. I think that Having a minimum score for each one speaks uh, to all of the standards and domains being important, um, and it doesn't allow for any of them to be, eh, well, you know what, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I really, I really appreciate it, that. Um, I just think it holds all of them at a, at a level of importance. Chart. Yeah. 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 By the same token, I think having um, something to achieve to allows people to say, okay, I may be at a minimum, but this is what I want to go to. So when you can see the, the tiering, that it allows people to have a goal. And Pam and I agree with both of them all that happened. This is Kristen, and a strength in this hybrid system, it um, aligns with um, the shining part. Um, our goal, provide an opportunity for early learning programs to shine and demonstrate their strength. The average. Anything from people on the phone? I, I also think building on, Kristen, on your thought about the positive, the goal three for SPARC, I think it relates to goal three for, or the principle three for the Learning Council to uh, moving um, beyond a cultural compliance to what a system is. Oh, yeah. So, what was that? Which is, uh, number three? Number three. Principle three. Yeah. Nice that we can see how they come together. Okay. I think we wrapped it up. Do you guys have anything else to finish this off? Woohoo! We're flying today. I love that. So, is that number three? Yeah, we were for the summaries. We did that summary. One, oh, one of our, I, what I hear us 
ending with is we've got a, we did a lot of good work and uh, professional development. Uh, we still want to uh, get some more information on that one. So at our next meeting, we should have a, a large portion of that time for professional development. Um, deeper dive is the best way to say that. Or educator qualifications. Um, and then with class, we also talked about that that's maybe more when we're in implementation phase, so not immediately not part of the initial right. approval, but we do want to get more information about that as part of looking at the system. And then also revisit the cheering. Um, just with class, I don't think there's a out of school age version of that. Okay. It's in the classroom, in the classroom. So, um, and I know you know this, Meredith, but there, there needs to be another school. Yeah, school. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the same thing with zero to three. I just class. We're there is a class. Class actually has, there's disagreement thing beyond. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we may need to explore that a little bit yeah. more as well. There's a reason why early head start doesn't mean class. class yes. Early head start. <laughs> so we probably should visit that as well. Then we should just title probably looking deeper at the observation tool yes. to measure teacher child interaction if we need to do that and include those pieces on zero to three um, after school type programs that aren't classroom based. So as part of that conversation we can look at it. So and I think that relates to Spark School yes. One as well as um, the early learning principle one, because that that cultural responsiveness is one of the bigger issues. In class. I'd like to see some evidence around class being used in family child care and whether that is an equitable assessment. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know. I, I just would like to know whether or not, because I think of it as so center based that I'm wondering whether it's a fair a different age groups and a different age groups. Yeah. Okay. That's all. I mean it might be. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was the feedback that I got from people who just I uh -huh. from the chair that came from that has looked at the factor and saying that I thought it was done fair. Mm -hmm. Oh sorry. I thought it was fair in the day of with my um my class chair. Okay. That was Autumn speaking. <coughs> So maybe we can tie, we need to tie some of these things back to the equity as well as the implicit bias to be sure that we aren't having some of that and that we are doing, doing good equity. The other question that we had, not, I don't want to stop the discussion, are there other summary things that we need to take back? We. <laughs> yeah. So in the recommendations that we kind of summarize at each point right, is yeah. the specific things that we take back, and those go directly to um, Western Oregon in cooperation with us. But we also report out to the um, to the Early Learning Council, um, and so you can always look that up online to see the report that we give. It, it's basically reflecting these summaries and the pieces that we've made to go forward to them as well. So it does go places you guys share. Well, the other good feedback was just domain. Framework draft that we had is a good way yeah. to go. So I think that's very good. Oh, and I and uh, the drilling down more on the population. So that we are achieving some of those individual um, interests that people had the very first day we met. And if there are some areas that we're not meeting, be sure and let us know. Then one other question that we had is we're scheduled to meet in July the 21st. We just want to double check that people. Do you have that on their calendar or not? Since we know that that is a vacation month <laughs> for some people. So does it still look good for people? Yeah. Well, we've been so uh, blessed to have good attendance. You know, people do have other schedules and other lives sometimes. <laughs> Sabrina says that works for her. Okay. Well, excellent. Great. So it August one or three? I just want to put uh, that on my calendar. Yes, it would be the third Friday. I think that's the date. Eighteenth. Yes. Okay. So. 
Next time in station will be the 21st of July here. We will uh, do a deeper dive into educator qualifications. We'll have a feedback a little bit about more on the cheering. Looking at uh, yeah, I think questions. if we could make like I think we've got some work plan. We need to kind of look where we're at with yeah. that oh, and yes. follow up. And I know right after this meeting, we actually go and do a debrief to kind of tease that those pieces out. Yes. We want to make sure that our people have enough time to implement and get everything rolled around. So, but we do know we have to do the special yes, yeah, qualification. Yeah. So fit it into the work plan. Yep. Any other thoughts or comments? We're ending early. This is shot out there. It is great. Don't worry. But one little comment, just so you guys understand the system. It notes it in the work plan that the next step, we've already talked to the equity committee, and you guys got the information back from what they said. And in the next couple months, we're going to meet with equity again. We're also meeting with the um, CCEC Child Care Education Committee, which is kind of looks at that roles and those type of pieces. And we're also going to be meeting with Best Beginning to let them know. So those are on um, the calendar in the next couple of months. And so we'll be circling back around and letting you know what they've had to say. So we're excited to have the second draft to be able to um, take out to them with all your guys' hard work. So thank you. And there are those dovetailing because with Best Beginnings, they've been looking at the professional development. And so we've been looking at those as well. So we want to be sure that we're in concert and not in whatever that is, <laughs> <laughs> non-concert. Any other? Well, thank you again. I really appreciate all the great thinking and the, the uh, discussion allowed people for us to even get greater thoughts. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy, Enjoy yes. Bye, everybody thank on the you. phone. Have a great weekend.